Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God the Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll consider today words by the Old Testament prophet Isaiah in his 60th chapter, verses 1 through 6. He writes about an epiphany. He writes about the light being revealed. Hear now the words from Isaiah. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is dawning upon you. Look, darkness covers the earth, and deep darkness covers the peoples. But the Lord will dawn upon you, and his glory will be seen over you. Nations will walk to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Look up. Look all around and see all of them have been gathered. They are coming to you. Your sons will come from far away, and people will, will carry your daughters on their side. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will race with excitement and burst with joy. For great riches from the sea will be delivered to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. Caravans of camels will cover your land. Young camels from Midian and Ephah, all those from Shiva will come. Then they will carry gold and incense, and they will announce the good news of the praise of the Lord. This is the word of our Lord. Ah, dearest Jesus, holy child, make thee a bed, soft undefiled, within my heart that it may be, a quiet chamber kept for thee. Amen. Dear friends in, in Christ Jesus, I had originally planned to speak today, uh, if you have a printed version in front of you, that is a similar train of thought what many of you heard last week about the Sunday after Christmas. We were still in that season, of, and, and sometimes epiphany is viewed that way. Now we've got to take down the tree. It's a letdown season, and maybe it's seen that way. But as I prepared that, and it's very true that it can be seen that way, um, Two events happened today that really made that introduction seem trite. When you think about a letdown season, I think about uh, a friend in Arizona who I just heard was returning from a trip to the Caribbean to see family in the Caribbean, and on the return trip, uh, one of their three-year-old twin daughters, who had some developmental disabilities, actually died on the airplane this morning. Wow, what, what a letdown returning from vacation. Another dear friend of mine told me that, well, a friend, uh, someone who is going to come visit this summer to South Texas because she is newly retired, they were looking forward to that visit, well, taking down Christmas decorations, she fell off the ladder, hit her head, and passed away. What a tragedy. What a letdown. And the pastor's going to come to you today, and you see what the sermon theme is. Celebrate Epiphany, or to celebrate Christ. Well, yes, we still celebrate. We don't celebrate tragedies and those events. Those are tragic, and... We sympathize with, with severe loss. But we do see that we are celebrating something. Not the tragedy, but the answer to the tragedy, which is exactly what Isaiah shares in the first words of the text. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is dawning upon you. That's what epiphany means. Uh, the light being turned on. And it's this day when we mark the arrival of the wise men to Bethlehem. These are the first non-Jews, the first Gentiles to see Christ the Savior. And so the two individuals who I spoke about, a three-year-old and a woman in her 60s, both members of God's kingdom who, are, who know Christ their Savior, and we can celebrate the truth of Christ. Celebrate Christ, celebrate Christmas, celebrate Epiphany for the right reasons, without distractions that sometimes come upon us. 
You think about in here, in here, the epiphany and turning on the light, and light and darkness. Light and darkness are oftentimes used throughout Scripture as uh, symbols, uh, as a contrast. Uh, darkness, the symbol of ignorance, and then also unbelief, and, and the connection with the devil, and connected to sin, and grief, and various difficulties of every kind. Jesus describes damnation itself, separation from God forever, as the outer darkness. And in the days before electricity and easy light, you had to work hard to get a fire going or keep even a candle burning, um, darkness is something much more intimidating even than it is today. And yet, another friend of mine recently, and the last year has gone from being able to see to complete blindness. Darkness is in his life, and what a scary, frightening, difficult, needless to say, dark thing to face. Verse 2 takes that picture of darkness and things going around and difficulty and brings that also to a worse kind of darkness, the darkness of being spiritually separated from God. Look, darkness covers the earth, and deep darkness covers the peoples. Uh, the nation of Israel was in the middle of a spiritual darkness because uh, they had enemies rattling their swords around them, and that caused a, a, a darkness for the nation. Dark days, we could say. But that happened because they had turned their back on God. The leaders of God's people, the Israelites, had gone after other things, false gods and prosperity and, and various distractions, turning away from the light, and God let darkness, enemies, and other dangers come in. It was difficult days for Israel, but the politics wasn't the worst thing. It was actually something that that, that leadership turning away from God trickled down to the very people who allowed then materialism to be the most important thing in their life. Self-centeredness crept into uh, most of the people's lives. It was an entertain became an entertainment society. That brought dark days for the entire society of the northern tribe of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. You see, people were giving lip service to God. Lip service, but then... Well, by the outward appearances, things looked good, but they had really stepped back from God, giving him only lip service and really forgetting about the truest, deepest message that the Savior of the world was coming to rescue them because they needed forgiveness for all of their sins. God promised the blessing of light through Isaiah, a light to shine in the darkness that was a forgiving light of God's love, revealing the truth that God loved them and that a Savior washed away all of their wrong, would wash away all of their wrongs. But the people remained in darkness. And so Isaiah tells them again, Arise, shine, your light has come. Listen to this message about God's love. This was the heart of God's message for his people ever since Eden, ever since the very beginning of the world, and immediately after that first fall into sin. That time period of Isaiah can probably be compared to our current situation, dark days, yeah, well, some might think about the dark days of, of political unrest that is upon us and the infighting in politics and then the trouble that, that is facing economy. And the term dark days is appropriately used by some. But even with that, I wonder if many of us would prefer to go back 100 years and go back to those days. And see, there are always dark days. And, um, and we recognize there's an answer that goes beyond those changes of length of lifespan that was shorter 100 years ago but longer today, or the, the, the less unrest that occurred in certain ages past. God's answer 
is actually answering that spiritual darkness. And when this passage from Isaiah talks about deep darkness, it's telling that the word translated in our version here, the Bible, deep darkness, is the very same word that is found in Psalm 23. Walking through the valley of the shadow of death, that dark valley, the valley of the shadow of death, it's the same word that's translated deep darkness here. See, there is an answer to that deep darkness. Even though I remember my wrongs when I consider those events of deep darkness, and I can picture the, 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 the tragedy for that young family, my friends in Arizona, or the tragedy for the, for the friend of our, of our uh, uh, abiding Savior family member who passed away, looking forward to retirement, and I think that could happen to me. And my guilt comes upon me. And I think about all the reasons why God doesn't need to be happy with me. The wrongs that I've committed, the things that I've done to hurt others. And it's a dark sort of thought. So we need the one thing that can, that can shine a light in this darkness. That can break through the clouds of this, that, that prevent us from seeing God's light. It is the gospel promise that Isaiah shared some 2,700 years ago. The light has come. The glory of the Lord is shining. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is dawning upon you. That glory of the Lord is a, is a wonderful term. It's found about 28 times in the Old Testament. And when you see that term, glory of the Lord, and you contrast it with the darkness of our sinful human humanity, our sinful natures. It's something that can fill you with fear. Think about how the children of Israel were shaking in, in their boots, in their shoes, at the, or in their sandals at the bottom of, of Mount Sinai when the glory of the Lord appeared. Moses, you go speak to God. Don't make us do that. That's what the glory of the Lord can do. But... God reveals his glory in a different way here from Isaiah. Not to fill you with fear. Not to make you afraid of what the holy God is going to do to a sinful human being. But to let us know that his glory, the glory of the Lord is also clothed in grace. He is coming near with glory to bless us with glory, to help us with glory, to rescue us, and yes, even rescue us from the valley of the shadow of death. This was the same glory that appeared to the shepherds over Bethlehem. It filled them with fear, but the angel quickly said, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. This is to the same glory that brought the wise men as they noticed that star when it rose and they went to worship the Christ child. They got to see the glory of God as they worshipped him. The Lord will dawn upon you, Isaiah says, and his glory will be seen over you. Darkness. Darkness hangs only over a place where Jesus is not. But the truth is, Jesus is. And Jesus is with you. He truly came so that when the darkness makes my conscience speak to me and makes me want to be filled with fear, Jesus tells my conscience to be quiet. If God's word shines in a cleansing, revealing, warming, and joy-bringing light. That's what verse 3 of the text says. Nations will walk to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Look up, look all around and see. All of them have been gathered. They are coming to you. Your sons will come from far away and people will carry your daughters on their side. You see, the prophet Isaiah saw what really is true that the Savior was not just coming for one group of people. The Savior was coming for the entire world. Kings from around the world would come, as we see from those wise men who went to go visit the Christ child. We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him, they said. That's why Epiphany is, is Christmas for 
the Gentiles. And we celebrate that. We celebrate that answer to darkness because that family who lost a three-year-old, that family that lost their dear, uh, their dear family member just as she was starting retirement, that man who was still on this earth facing dark, the darkness of blindness, well, they have the light of knowing Christ Jesus. And those of us who know Christ Jesus know that those situations have an answer in the presence of our Savior Jesus. However severe the situation that we may face. Whether it's an illness like the one that prevented me from worshiping with y'all in church last weekend, the Lord was still with me and the Lord allowed you to be fed by the Word of God. God is with us in those situations and His light shines. But even in that deepest tragedy of an unexpected death, friends, you realize what I had to tell myself after those two recent events that I heard of this afternoon. That three-year-old girl is welcoming that newly retired woman, not into retirement, but into heaven and in the joy of being in the presence of God. And friends, we, we have that light because of what Christ did. And so this is actually really the last day of Christmas, officially, the 12th day of Christmas. And do you know where the word Christmas comes from? Actually, Christmas is Christ's Mass, probably pretty similar. If you would have had to guess, that's probably what you would have said. We don't use the word Mass in our circles very often for when we celebrate Holy Communion, but it, it, its origin is, is re recognizable. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we don't use the word Mass, but Mass is actually from the Latin that was said for years and years and years at the conclusion of the Supper, Ita misa est. Go, you are sent. I say something very similar at the end, right? That as a blessing for you. Go in peace. And so, as you are sent from Christmas, or sent from the Lord's table, you have that peace. You have that peace because you have the Lord's light that shines, whether you can see with your eyes or not. You have that peace of knowing that his body and blood are given for you, his blood shed for you, so that you have that forgiveness of sins, that we participate with our Lord in this wonderful, wonderful reason to celebrate. We have a Savior, that we celebrate Christ without distractions. When you know these things, you have an opportunity to do something that's on the sign. I don't know if you noticed it on your drive-in. You can take a look next time you're heading south on Westgate and take a glance at it. It says, count your blessings, not your burdens. We could all count our tragedies and problems that we face, but when we count the blessing of knowing our Savior Christ Jesus, what a wonderful new perspective we have. That we, with grief filling, filling our eyes and our hearts, can recognize the tragedy, the burden of the loss of a loved one, but then have the blessing of knowing that loved one is with the Lord. When you know that about the blessings from God, you have a reaction in the same way that those wise men did when they saw Jesus. They took a few things, right? Gold and frankincense and myrrh. Isaiah's words to conclude this section of scripture were really a prophecy of those incense, be, those gifts being brought to the Messiah. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will race with excitement and burst with joy. For great riches from the sea will be delivered to you. Caravans of camels will cover your land. Young camels from Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba will come. They will carry gold and incense and they will announce the good news of the praise of the Lord. Yes, when they went to visit the Christ child, they took gifts. They just didn't take their, themselves. Right? And we do that as well. Right? 
when we celebrate this peace that Christ gives, when we celebrate and know the light that is revealed in, in Christ Jesus, we are moved to give gifts as well. Maybe opening our pocket books, maybe opening up our, our time schedule for serving God in His church or serving our neighbor. Many opportunities for us to offer treasures just like the wise men did. So whatever tragedy is facing you this week, or whatever way that taking down the decorations may be a letdown, and you say, Epiphany is a letdown season, it is not. It is not a season of letdown, it is a season of being lifted up. Lifted up in the light of the Lord's love. And that lifting up doesn't change with the seasons doesn't change with the ups and downs of our lives. It is constant. Arise, shine, for the glory of the Lord shines on you in Christ. Amen.